For the last week, um, God has been really dealing with me to talk about something. If you notice, most of my sermons have been structured around basically someone that's been a Christian, someone that's uh, already made that profession of faith, because I really believe that God has led me to a place of saying, Earl, it is so important. Like, we don't really realize how important it is to get to a place to say, I am growing, I am maturing, I am getting, um, you know, somewhere that I wasn't last week. And so God has really been dealing with me out on messages, and that's why the messages are turning into what they're turning into. And today I want to talk about a God-filtered life. A God-filtered life. A God-filtered... Let's say all together. You ready? God-filtered life. I really believe that every single person that's in here should lead a God-filtered life. To literally have everything that's coming through us that say, I'm going to channel my whole entire existence, my life, everything that's going on about me through the filter of what God wants in my life. And I want to tell you the reason why I'm preaching this sermon is because that does not always happen. We, most of us don't have a God filter in a lot of places in our life. Most of us don't have uh, where we're saying, well, what would God think about this before I do this? A lot of times we just react and then we turn around and say, oh, I'm so sorry, God. I messed up. I'm so sorry, God. I made that mistake. I, I, and when, too many times we're having to go back. And I feel like God is saying, as you grow as a Christian, there needs to be a lot less of those times where you have to go back and, and keep going back and going back and going back and saying, God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. God, I'm sorry. And I really feel like God is saying, if you would just filter your life through me, there'll be a whole lot less of those times where you have to turn back around and say you're sorry. Filter your life through my word. Filter your life through what I want for you. Amen? Amen. 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 Say, I need to be filtered. I need to be filtered. Now tell your neighbor, you need to be filtered. Yeah, yeah see, I, I, you meant that more than you meant it for yourself. I guarantee you did. You need to be filtered. I know you do. I don't know about me. I'm good. Right? Everything, if you're a coffee drinker in here, raise your hand. If you drink coffee, raise your hand. I remember when I was young and we used to go camping and we went camping every single weekend. And all the time, I can always remember my dad always saying these little words is, where are the filters? Always saying, where are the filters at? Where are the filters at? I was always hearing this. I can remember being very, very young. My mom and dad drank coffee still to this day like it's going out of style. Like, no matter what time you go to their house, they're drinking coffee. And I know there's people in here that do the exact same thing, but if you are a coffee drinker, unless you've got some kind of coffee pot that you don't have to put a filter in, filters are a big part of your life of drinking coffee. You want to make sure that when you're drinking, could you imagine that if somebody gave you a whole cup of coffee and just dump the grinds right in it. And he just took a big old drink and it's like, ooh, that's nasty. But I mean, that's what it would be like, right? So you have to filter to get the result, to get the liquid, to get the thing that you want. And it's not just coffee. I'm not a big coffee drinker, but I drink tea. It's the same process. Whenever I make tea at home, I'm boiling the water and I get the four or five coffee, you know, the tea bags and I'm stirring them in there until it's boiling and then I put me about eight cups of sugar in the... In the I know how to make some tea, man. It's a sugar. You got to have a lot of sugar. And people come over to my house and they're like, dude, you need to filter some of that sugar out. Don't put so much in there. But it, the tea is the same exact way and it doesn't matter if you drink water. I mean most of what you consume and it goes in your body as far as liquids has been at some time, some place filtered. If it's water, they either got filtered at a plant before you bought it in a bottle. Some of you have filters that are on your, uh, your sinks at home. No matter what you do, uh, the water that you consume, it's all been filtered at some time, some place. Most of you would not realize that when you get that normal water out of your tap, I mean, if you were to get it when it first started, it would look like dirt. When it first started... And I feel like God is saying, Earl, you know, when you start out, you don't look too good. Like the inside of you and all your actions and all your thoughts and all your motives, as they're coming out of you, they don't look too good. But over the filtering process of being a Christian and, and going through my word and listening to sermons and being involved with other Christians, that's why it's important to come to church because church is kind of like a filter, right? 
It's kind of, I mean, when you come to church and you hear a sermon and you're singing songs, you're filtering your life. You're around other Christians and you're seeing how they're acting, they're seeing how you're acting, and it's kind of a filter on your life so you can get through the rest of the week. And I love coming to church. I mean, I wasn't even going to be here today because me and my wife was going to stay. Uh, it's 22 years of marriage uh, yesterday. Amen? Yeah. I don't know how she put up with me, but she has. I mean, she's put up with a lot, y'all. <laughs> Amen. I ain't going to deny it. She put up with a whole lot. But, I mean, I, yesterday we were going to stay down in Glasgow where Autumn went through her graduation. And we was going to send all the kids home and stay down at this little bed and breakfast, which is really awesome down there called Four Seasons. And, uh, but I really don't like missing church. I don't like not being here. Josh said, hey, I'll preach for you. It's not a big deal if you want to stay. But when I got to thinking about it, um, yes, I would like to stay down in Glasgow, but there's something about coming to church. There's something about being in this body and coming and being active. If, if I miss a week, I don't feel right. So I would rather just say, no, we're going to come on back. We'll come down another time and, and we'll drive back for that. You know, I'm sure we'll drive back for that Sunday too. But I think that church is like a filtered. And I want a God-filtered life. Do you know what filters do? Is they maintain things. That's what filters do. If you're going to have a God-filtered life, then we need to understand, really, in all honesty, what is a filter? What, I looked up the definition, and it's kind of funny. The definition for a filter, the noun, this is the noun definition, it's a device for removing impurities or solid particles from a liquid or gas that has passed through it. An example would be an oil filter. So it's a device and it's a thing. The verb meaning means it's to pass a liquid, a gas, a light, or sound through a device to remove unwanted material. So basically, like your oil filter, you know, when I, I'm filtering my coffee or I'm filtering this or I'm filtering that or my oil filter is filtering all the oil in my car. And when I started thinking about a filter, in, in the Bible... Sort of like the noun version of a filter. Isn't that kind of like our filter? Like we run our life through the words of God. And we are the filtering process. And when we, when we look at the Bible and we say, God, this is my filter. And I'm reading this word. I'm passing my life through this Bible. And as you need to make changes, as you need to take out the impurities, they need to be held back so that what the, the result of what comes out on the other side isn't what you would expect. And I would look at my brother Jerry. When Jerry first come out of jail, you know, I mean, violent offender, spent 10 to 12 years in prison. Most of that 10 or 12 years was in solitary confinement. You know, they were calling me up as a pastor saying, can you please come and talk to him? I mean, we, he's crazy. We don't know what's wrong with him. And, you know, had him under suicide watch and everything else. And, I, and that's the Jerry that I met three years ago that showed up at Church 2020. But three years of filtering his life he looks a whole lot different today. Like they wouldn't, them guards, that they're, they're going to recognize him when he comes in. But he may look the same physically. Actually, I don't think he does get that big old mountain man beard. But they don't even look the same. But when he goes in, if they recognize that this is Jerry, they may think that we're in for a bunch of trouble. But the filtering process of what God has done in his life and took some of those impurities out, Amen. that's what should happen to us. Amen. Now maybe not on the scale of being a violent offender over here or not, but maybe from just being, you know, I I'm angry sometimes or I'm angry often or I have a problem with forgiveness. And as you pass your life through what the Word of God says and you look at it over a three-year period and a four-year period and a five-year period, the impurities start to come out so that you you actually truly do have a God-filtered life. I want you to, <laughs> this morning, like I said, coming to church is kind of like a pass-through. It's kind of like coming in the filter, going out the filter. Next week we'll see you again in the filter, out the filter. And my prayer for you is over the last 17, 18, 19 years of coming to church every single week, regardless whether I was a pastor or whether I wasn't a pastor. When I was sitting and listening to sermons or whether I'm giving sermons, the result is the same. There are people who come in these doors every single week who truly want to be God-filtered. They truly want to be God-filtered. And there's also people that come in every single week just out of habit 
that have no intentions on being God-filtered. And I want to change that. I want Revive to be the church where every single person that comes in here literally says, I want a filtered life. Everything in my life is open for God to change if He wants to change it. And I hope that you feel that way too. And I know this is not the classic, you know, but anytime you start talking about growth, the problem is, is it's not flashy. That's the problem with, with like, you know, growth sermons and, and trying to help people get to the next level with their relationship with God. They're not very flashy, but if taken very seriously, they are very, very effective. I promise you they're effective. So today I want to give you three areas, just three areas that need to be God-filtered, that people, the people of God need to filter and be God-filtered in our life, in your life, in my life, in all of our lives. Just three areas. The first one is our thoughts. Our thoughts need to be God-filtered. Our thoughts are usually going to be the very first thing that's either going to take us down or it's going to build us up. It's going to be that thing that's going to tell you you're never going to make it or it's going to be that thing that's going to tell you that, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that oh, you know, woe is me, I'm not going to make it or that, that God can take control. Right now it looks like that Jerry's going to be in jail for 90 to 120 days. I think God can change that. Why? Because God says I can do all things. I can do all things. All things. I was sitting back here today and I was thinking, is there anything that we can do, God, that would speed this parole hearing up? I mean, God, I just want him back in here and I want him back in the fold. I want him back in this kid's life. And I know it ain't even been a week yet, but I don't want it to be a day, folks. Why? Because anything out there alone is like that tree I was talking about last week. Right now, Jerry's out there and he's getting blowed by the storms and I want him back in the forest of Revive. And I, I, I do believe that if you'll come in here today and you'll say, my thoughts, I am going to start looking at my thoughts through a God-filtered life, through a God-filtered process, I think that I think, I think, I think that God can change a lot of your situations when you just get your thoughts under, you know, under control. Somebody once told me that God does not give you grace for imagination. Think about that. God does not give you grace for what you can imagine up that's going to happen. God does not give you grace for the things that you can say, well, this could happen or this could happen. And most times, I'm going to tell you, in my life, I try to look at things positively. But most times when somebody comes to me with a problem, the very first thing I do, I start thinking, like, how bad could this be? Like, what is, like, I mean, what are we looking at? Like, like could it go this far or could it go this far? How bad could this possibly be? And then what I do is I try to prepare for the worst that it possibly could be and then hope for the best. And that's not really always the best thing to do, folks. Because I think that if I would take the thought that was come in and just make it captive to what the Word of God says. Make it captive to what God says about my situation. I want you to listen to this. 2 Corinthians 10.5 We demolish arguments. You ever think about demolishing arguments? I, did, I, I was thinking, what are you thinking when you wrote this? We demolish arguments and every pre pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. That is powerful stuff, folks. When you're talking about demolishing arguments, demolishing the things that come up in your head, demolishing the thoughts that come in and says, you're never going to make it. You're never going to be good enough. You're never going to get to this place. You're never going to do this thing that God's planned for your life. I'm never, you know, my kids are going to turn out bad. All these thoughts are going to come to your head. And if you don't do something with them thoughts, you're going to entertain those thoughts. And the problem with entertaining those thoughts is it goes right into number two. Right into number two. People of God need to learn how to have God-filtered emotions. Because see, thoughts, when entertained, turn into emotions. And those emotions are either going to be for God or they're going to be against God. And I want you to look at this verse, Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. It says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. What's them first words? Let's say them all together. Be angry. I mean, let's just stop right there. Why do people think that as a Christian you never get angry? Or when you get angry that that's automatically a sin. I've been fuming before. 
And it's not really a sin, folks, to get emotionally upset or to get emotionally angry. It's what I do with those emotions, what I do with that anger that's going to decide, am I going to sin or not sin? Every person in here has been guilty of being angry at some point in your life. If you haven't, you're living in some fantasy dream world, man. We all get angry. Last week, they were trying to get all the sound right up here on stage, and I was just standing over there, and you could cut the tension with a knife. I'm just like, I ain't saying nothing to nobody. I mean, I'm hearing comments like, what's that noise? I know what that noise is. And I'm just like, oh. <laughs> right? Because you might be the guy to come in and have nothing to do with it. You come into that like, hey, hey, what do you think about this? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? I mean, it could happen. I am not taking the fall. Not being the fall guy. So I've learned. I've learned this over here. I didn't used to be like this, folks. I would just jump right in there and try to make it better. Like, like I don't know why we got to be so angry. Come on, guys. Let's get there together and pray. When you're angry, the last thing you want to do is pray, folks. I'm going to tell you. Because you're wanting to pray that God just chopped somebody off with the knees. You know what I mean? That's, but you can feel the tension but with a knife. And I'm just like, woo <laughs> <laughs> I walked right out that back door. I did. I left them all up here by themselves. And I went right out that. I went through the band room. Well, all the way out to the foyer. And I just got me a donut and just licked the glaze. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't want nothing to do with that. And I come back about 20, 30 minutes later and, and, and Dustin's standing back there. And I'm like, dude, you can cut the tension with a knife this morning. He's like, I know, right? And I'm like, let's just be quiet. He's like, yep. You know? But sometimes, if you listen, your emotions, you got to control your emotions. Because you know what I've learned about emotions? Here's what I've learned. This is, I want you to take this with you today. Take this with you today. Because you can work really, 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 really hard to make something right. You can work really, really hard and see something be so successful that took hours, it took months, it took years to perfect and be successful for whatever you're working at. I've seen people work, I mean, literally, it's scars on their hands to make something right. I mean, just putting every bit of effort in. And you know how long? It takes about two minutes of saying something. Letting your emotions get control to ruin what you built in five years. It only takes about two minutes to let your emotions do something. So if you don't learn how to control your emotions, be angry and do not sin. Sometimes you got to get angry and just back away. Just let it go. Back away, take you some time, whatever thing's running through your head, try to get them under control before you say something, right? You don't want to say something because that's our next point coming up here in a second. Do not sin. But I love what it says and it finishes out there. But don't, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Do you, know what, do, you know what, do you know what the Bible is really telling us we need to filter? It's all these emotions that go through us should be there at a very temporary time. That's what that's really saying. Like I really believe if Jesus could step up here and talk to you right now, or if one of the disciples could step up here, here's what they would say. Why would you ever let your emotions take a roller coaster ride for more than 24 hours? Like, you can be angry, but you still got to let it go soon. I mean, don't let the sun go down on your anger. And, and I don't even want to get into the biblical, you know, exactly what that's saying. But I, I'll tell you this. I do believe without a shadow of a doubt that it's saying, don't let the sun go down on your anger means that whatever you're angry about, whatever has got you emotionally fired up, whatever has made some thoughts run through your head that you know somebody else might be wrong because whenever you're angry, typically you're angry at something or someone that whatever the situation is, just step back for a second and don't let that anger ride more than a day. Get over it. Don't sin. Why? Because anything not dealt with will just build up and become a mountain in your life. Now, I don't know who that's for today. But some of you in here can carry out stuff for weeks. Some of you in here can carry out stuff for years. I remember, remember a conversation, and I'm not even going to tell you who it was, but it was in my family. <laughs> I heard this conversation. This is crazy. 
This is about a year ago. I'm sitting at a kitchen table, and one of my family members says this. They start crying over somebody coming to a funeral, over something that happened when they were 13 years old. And they were in their 70s. They are in their 70s today. And I'm listening to this. I'm like, so let me, I'm just trying to get, outline this for us. Let's outline this. So they're not invited to the funeral. And you're not dead yet. But when you die. So you're like, you're speaking like, like I ain't angry today. I'm angry like tomorrow and even when I die. So they can't come to your funeral when you die. But today you're over 70. And we're going to go all the way back to when you were 13 years old. Over something that they did that they have no idea about marbles. Like stole some marbles. I just can't even, I'm like, am I on the Jerry Springer show or something? Is this really my family? Are you that crazy? And then you know what's funny is that when you say it like that, they start thinking like, that's really dumb, ain't it? I'm like, you're talking about 60 year old marbles that nobody's got. Like, they're not, like, made of gold. Like, they're not, like, some family, you know, like, loom or something. that You know, it's like the expensive thing that you can go back and get. Think about it. But listen, anything that's not dealt with quickly will just fester and fester and fester. People look for new churches because of things that's festering that they haven't dealt with. Well, I remember that one time I was walking out and you didn't say hi to me and I didn't even see you. <laughs> I was like, what? I know you didn't see me, but you should have saw me. Or that time I was in the hospital four years ago when I was getting my ingrown toenail cut out, you didn't come. And I'm like, dude, four years, I don't even know where I was four years ago. I mean, I could have been on my deathbed. I don't know. I mean, who knows? Don't let it fester. Get over it quick. Don't get over it quick. Why? Because that's what God says we need to do. Don't fester over it. You want a God filled her life? To do the things that God says to do. Amen. Number three, if our thoughts, which is point one, get out of control, that will lead us right into number two, which is our emotions getting out of control. And soon as our, soon as our emotions get out of control, the very first thing, now I mean out of control, the very first thing that comes out typically is our words that we speak come out out of control. That's what happens. Proverbs 18.21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. What the Bible is telling you right there is that the things that come out of your mouth is sowing some seeds. And you can sow some good seeds of encouragement. You can sow some good seeds of God is just doing miraculous things. Or you can sow some seeds of being defeated. You can sow some things in people that they may never get over. You know, I, I can handle, I remember, this is what's crazy about, about words. And most of you, I guarantee you when I say this, you're always going to have something that just pops in your head from when you was a little kid. Things that people would say to you. I remember going down the road one day. One day I remember going down the road. And I was singing this song, and my dad played every single weekend at Eagle Valley. Man, people would look up to my dad, and they would say, that guy can flat play the guitar, he can flat sing. Man, he is awesome. And every single weekend, I would have to go look at my dad on stage, and I would, like, idolize him. And everybody in the campground, man, I mean, my family, like, I mean, everybody knew Joe Breeden at Eagle Valley. Like, when you're a kid, that's big. When you get to be an adult, you realize that that's just a campground, right? <laughs> but when you're little, that's like, that's like big, man. That's like, the, like Washington, D.C., you know, when you're a kid. But every weekend I would go and I would, man, I used to remember, I'm going to be just like my dad. 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 And I remember going down the road one day and I was singing a song. And I know he didn't mean it. But I was singing and trying to sing like my dad. And my dad was watching me through the rearview mirror of the Astro van. And I was trying to give it that country George Jones twang. <laughs> when you're 10, it's hard. You know? And I don't remember the song, whatever it was. But I remember it being something like that. 
And I let out one or two lines of it. And my dad looked in the mirror. And I could just see that I wasn't even close. <laughs> I wasn't even close, man. And I was trying hard. Like I was trying to impress him with my voice at like 10 years old. And my dad was like, eh, that's a little rough. Now he might have meant that for complete encouragement. But folks, I'm going to tell you, at 43 years old, 33 years ago, I still remember some words that literally felt like my dad got out of the seat and jumped back two aisles and stabbed me right in my heart. Because for many years after that, I would not sing in front of nobody. For many years after that, every time somebody would ask me to play something or do something, I'd say no. And it wasn't until I was 28 years old to where I was at Sherman uh, Full Gospel and I joined the band and we practiced like three times a week. We never ever played one concert because I didn't want to sing in front of people. And then when I went to First Love, I got pushed into a position where I had no choice but to be out there and I ended up having to sing and I got over it. But I'm going to tell you, words are powerful and have the power of life and have the power of death. And you may not mean, my dad, I guarantee you, if my dad is here today, and I don't know if he's here, but if he heard that story, he would be weeping and he would be crying to, to know that 33 years ago, something that he said affected me because he knew that he was always my super dad. He knew that. He still today is my super dad. The greatest mistake I ever made in my wedding is not making my dad my best man. That's what I wanted to do and I should have done that. So he, I know he didn't mean it, but folks, listen to me. You can say things sometimes that you may never mean. And I'm telling you parents this right now. When you say things to your kids, make them believe that they can be anything that they can possibly be. Don't tell them they can't be something. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, you're looking at a kid that, you know, that, you know, can't hardly even run. And I ain't telling you to tell him he's going to be Michael Jordan. You know? Like, I'm going to be the best basketball player ever, Daddy. You know, I mean, my son's not going to be Michael Jordan. I love my son. He ain't going to be Michael Jordan. He ain't. But I, I don't want the words that I say to cause death in his heart. Folks, you all come in, this, in these doors every single week and you have conversations with people and every single word that you say, you may not realize, has the power of destroying someone or lifting them up. You have the power to destroy someone or lift them up. You have a choice. Your words... Your tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 17, 27 says, The one who has the knowledge uses words with restraint, and whoever has understanding is even-tempered. So what the Bible is telling us right there is every word that comes out of our mouth should be strained. It should be filtered. It should have a restraint put on it. Just don't let it fly. Because when you let things fly... You can do a lot more damage than you will ever realize. You may not be around somebody for 20, 30 years and you have, may have said something 30 years ago that they're still holding against you today. And you don't even know it. Maybe you don't even care. But the truth is, is I want to tell you that the words that you speak has power of life and death. And you're not representing yourself. Do you know who we represent in here, folks? God. You come in this church today and you call yourself a Christian, you have to be God-filtered. You have no choice. Why? Because you're representing, representing something so much greater than me or you will ever be. I'll never be greater than God. I'm representing God. Everything that I do, everything that I say, I'm representing something so much bigger than me. So are you. So that hug that you give somebody today when you leave this church could be the very thing that brings them back in the doors next week. That encouraging word that you say to someone today, like, hey man, I really like your hair that you got it done. 
And maybe that stock has been just tearing them up. Maybe they had their hair done. I seen a girl one day come to the front and sit and cry because somebody had a haircut. It happens. Our emotions and our thoughts can take over. So your words of encouragement, your words, how you treat people and the things that you say and the thoughts that come through your head, use them as a God filter for doing God things and believe the impossible. Believe that when you get up out of your seats. Everybody stand up for just one second. Now I'm getting ready to show you a video in just a second. And I'm going to have you sit back down for that video. But here's what I want you to do right now. And I want you to do this with all your heart. With every single thing that's in you. Forget about yourself for one second. Just one second for me. Just one second. Please, for the love of God, forget about you know, how Earl's doing today or, or what this is going to, what I'm doing after, after you know, the service today. Forget about every single thing right now for just one second. Clear your mind. And I want you to do something. I want you to take a very slow, very slow. Now you're talking about like, ha, 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 got it, I'm done. That was real good. I want you to just take a real slow look around this, the whole audience. Don't look at the walls. Just take a real slow look at every person you can possibly see that's sitting around you right now. Go ahead. Oh, some of you got good slow motion. I like it. Now, I don't know if you zeroed in on some faces as you're turning back around. Folks, let me tell you something. This is why we're here. Every single face that you've seen as you were turning, every single face that you saw as you turned, God is saying, there's a picture. There's a picture of Christ. 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 Now everybody sit back down and watch this video. Imagine being given a painting that is so absolutely beautiful that you decide not only to rearrange your furniture, but you actually decide to redo the whole house because that painting is just so amazing. You're like, I've never seen anything like it before and it, it just wasn't enough to rearrange the furniture, but, but I'm gonna knock down this wall, I'm gonna take down that wall, I'm gonna rearrange the whole thing so that this will be the center, this will be the focal point of not only just the room, but the whole house. Friends, that is what it's like to have a life with Jesus at the center. We see his beauty, we see his glory, we see his perfection, what he's done for us on the cross, what he will do in the new creation. And as a result, everything changes. Everything is rearranged around him and that is what God wants to do today and that is what God wants to do this year. That our lives would be totally rearranged around the beauty and truth of who he is. That we would continually look at God and his glory and his splendor and say, what kind of life should I live? How should I live now? How should my life be reordered in a way that turns away from sin and turns towards Christ. This is what it's like. It's like rebuilding a whole house around a beautiful painting. The one reason I wanted to show that video is because every single one of us is going home. Every one of us is building something. And if we don't filter our thoughts, our emotions, and our words, if we don't have a God-filtered life, folks, I don't ever want you to be mistaken about this. You are painting something. You are painting something in your life. And you're either painting... A life that's Christ-centered. Or you're painting something else that's a distortion of what God really wants. I want a life that's God-filtered. I want you to want a life that's God-filtered. I want you to say, Lord, with every single thing that's in me, God, I've been saved for this many years, God. And God, all my thoughts... 
God. I want to be God filtered. God, all my emotions, I want to be God filtered. God, I want every single word that's in me to be God filtered. Now, I know there's more, and I know that's not an exhausted list of the things that God wants to change in our, in, in, in our life. But I promise you this, 95% of what you deal with has to do with your thoughts. 90% of what you deal with has to do with your emotions. And 90% of what you deal with is the words that come out of your mouth. Because you can always tell the picture that somebody's painting by the words that's coming out of their mouth. By what they're professing.